As human beings, we're very poor at judging things in isolation, especially the value of things. Business of Architecture, episode 282. Hello, Architect Nation. Welcome back. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today, we welcome Ian Motley to the show. Ian is a proposal writing and negotiation expert for the architecture industry. Formerly, he worked for Foster Partners advising on proposal and negotiation strategies. Now he runs Blue Turtle Consulting with his partner, Alexander Howison. Blue Turtle provides training and consulting services to the AEC industry, and you may have seen their popular proposal writing workshop advertised in the United States, Australia, New Zealand, and they're even in the UK. I attended several years ago, and I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that it should be mandatory training for you if you're listening to the Business of Architecture podcast. In today's episode, you'll discover five critical proposal mistakes and how to avoid them. If you haven't already, get free instant access to the four-part Architecture from Profit Map video that I've prepared for podcast subscribers by going to freearchitectgift.com. You'll be directed to a page where you can enter in your email address and you'll get instant access to that video that shows you what you need to do to be able to double your architecture firm income in the next 12 months. Now, before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to give you a heads up about a podcast that you may want to check out if you're an architect designer or someone interested in the world of design. My friends, David Lee, And Marina Borderine host the Midnight Charette podcast, which in their own words is an explicit podcast about design, architecture, and people, but be warned, it's often not safe for work. So if you're looking for some witty insider commentary that is at times thought-provoking and disturbing and at other times lighthearted and entertaining, check out the Midnight Charette in your favorite podcast app today. And with that, let's get on with the show. Ian, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you very much for having me. So now we're going to talk about a subject that I think is going to be very valuable for our listeners because the entry point to working with an architecture professional services firm is the proposal. And you're going to share with us today as a proposal writing and negotiation expert, five of the top mistakes that you see architects making in their proposal process. Yes. Well, let's jump, let's jump right into it, Ian. And let's talk about what's the first thing that, uh, the first mistake that you've identified that you can share with us. Well, thank you very much, Enoch. I would have to say the first perhaps uh, problem that most design professionals suffer from is they focus too much on what they are charging the client. They're focusing too much on the actual number. They're thinking to themselves, is that number uh, low enough to get conversions? And is it high enough to manage my profit level? And the reason this is perhaps a mistake is because uh, what the research is telling us is that it's not so much what you charge, but it's how you present those charges that influences your success, okay? Um, According to the Harvard professor, Gerald Zoltman, over 95% of purchasing decisions are based on emotional criteria. So once again, it's not what you're charging, it's how you present those charges that's going to influence whether they say yes or no to your proposal. Um, so that's the first mistake is just submitting a single fee fee proposal. Okay, let's let's dig into that a little bit here. So if if they're not, and you're you're absolutely right, this is what I see in the industry as well as the focus on what I'm charging. I don't want to charge too little that I can't make some money on this. I don't want to charge too much that I price myself out of the market, right? So if they're not focusing on that, what are the other things that they should be focusing on? Well, there's many factors that they need to focus on. As an example, um, first of all, we need to understand that purchasing decisions are made with emotions. So we need to focus on our clients' emotional criteria. You know, what's going to get them to say yes? What's going to get them to say no? And we know the answer to this question because we can learn about what their interests are with regards to the project. So, for example, some clients might be interested in saving money. They might be commercial developers. And they want to know how can we help them save money on their project. So this is something we would want to focus on within our proposal. Um, Other clients might be interested in, um, for example, if they're a city uh, client, uh, they might want to increase tourism in their town or city. 
And so they might be focused on getting something a little bit more iconic, a little bit more unique to attract more visitors to the city. So that's perhaps what we'd want to focus on. Um, other clients, let's say residential, um, might be interested in just satisfying their needs as a family uh, in the house. And so we might want to focus on, on that side within our proposal. So these are the interests that clients have, and this is what we need to be focusing on within our proposal. Awesome. Take us through mistake number two. Um, mistake number two is probably that too many design professionals adopt a traditional pricing model when they go to price their design services. So traditionally, what we all tend to do in this industry is we start this process by first of all meeting with the client at their home or perhaps their project site. And usually we do this free of charge, okay? We then, once we've met with them, we start to learn about their project and what they're trying to achieve. Uh, we try and define the brief for the project. We then go away and we typically estimate our time required to complete that brief. And then once we've got an estimate of our hours, our time it takes, we typically balance that estimate with what we think the client is prepared to spend or what we think the market will allow. And then we propose to the client a proposal that usually includes either a lump sum fee or a percentage fee, meaning a percentage of the construction cost or an hourly rate fee perhaps. And when we take this approach, um, it fails to address our client's emotional criteria. All we're doing is providing them with a single fee fee proposal, an hourly rate or a lump sum fee or a percentage. And the problem with this approach is when a client receives, uh, let's say, a percentage fee, like let's say they receive a fee of, and I'm just making this up, it's not a recommendation, uh, but a fee of 10% for design services as an example, yeah? As human beings, we're very poor at judging things in isolation, especially the value of things. So if I'm a client and I receive a proposal from a design professional with a fee of 10% in that proposal, I don't know if that's a good fee or a bad fee, because as human beings, we find it very difficult to judge the value of things in isolation. So inevitably, in order to me, for me to be able to make a decision and feel good about my purchasing behavior, I need something to compare that fee against. So inevitably, I'm gonna solicit proposals from other design firms to see what they're charging, and then I will base my decision at the end of the day on the different fees that have been presented. And typically as a client, I will do this without a true understanding of the different scopes that are being offered and the different value that each design firm has to offer. So this is the traditional model that we're all using. And it's a problem because it fails to address our client's emotional criteria. And therefore we're getting judged purely on price. And inevitably when we get judged purely on price, in order for the client to feel good, they're gonna negotiate that price down. So we need to change that model. The traditional model no longer works. Uh, the traditional model is what economists would call first degree price discrimination. And we need to change that model and start adopting either second or third degree price discrimination. And tell me about that, Ian, what is that? So second and third means uh, in, in summary, uh, in a quick sort of summarized version, it means offering your client different options to address their interests instead of just one fee and service option. Okay, so it's using a versioning, uh, a versioning strategy or something of that nature. Got it. And so when, uh, when you see firms offering just a one size fits all approach, and they're, what I'm hearing from you is that their clients are going out to the market and their clients are then, to get that reference point, they may be looking at fee proposals from other firms without an understanding of the scope that actually goes into each one of those fee proposals. Exactly. I, I'm a project manager uh, by trade. I trained as a project manager at university 20 plus years ago. Um, and even with 20 years experience, it's very challenging for somebody with my experience to actually look at different scopes from different firms and really and truly understand the differences in the design service that's being offered. So you can imagine for people that don't do this on a daily basis, how much more challenging it is for them to understand the differences. So as human beings, we won't take the time to try and understand the differences in this different, uh, different firms. What we're going to do is we're going to take the path of least resistance. And we're just going to look at the fee and we're going to focus purely on the fee, which is why we end up comparing the fees and negotiating the fees down. And that's what we're all suffering from nowadays. And can you describe to me what a proposal that uses the second or third degree price discrimination, what would that look like if you were to describe it to us? 
So the theory behind it is, is that you would offer two or maybe three or however many options you like. So instead of just saying to the client, I can design, let's take a residential project, I can design your home for you and it's going to cost X percent and that's it, take it or leave it. Instead of taking that approach, what you would say is there's different ways I can design your home for you. There's different levels of my involvement that you can uh, point me for. And so we can do offer you option A at X percent or we can offer you option B at Y percent. And then you demonstrate what is the differences between those two services. And when you approach the process in this manner, uh, what you see is clients stop just focusing on the fee and they start to focus on the work that's being done for each option that's being offered. So immediately it becomes a more ethical fee proposal because the clients are becoming more involved in the work that you're actually going to do for them. And therefore, they're, made, they're able to make more informed purchasing decisions. And making an informed purchasing decision is all part of an ethical fee proposal. So that, in a nutshell, is second and third degree price discrimination. Ian, I know a lot of times firm owners, when they're trying to implement strategy like this, they have difficulty separating out what would be their different options or their different versions, as you might say, their different tiers. What suggestions yeah. do you have for allowing firms to do this when they're so used to just providing one option for their uh, clients while still giving them an excellent experience? Well, that's, that's a very good question. So first of all, you need to understand what are your client's interests? What is motivating them to go forward with the project? And what is causing them unease? What's causing them concerns that might cause them to not go forward with the project? So first of all, we need to understand what are their interests and different clients have different interests. For example, residential clients are building for personal taste, okay? So commercial clients aren't building for personal taste, they're building to make a living. And because of that, they have different interests. So if you're working with a residential client and you wanted to offer them options, you could perhaps, depending on the experience and the skill set you have in your office, you could offer them different levels of options depending on sustainable design, for example. So you could offer them um, a basic option, which includes your basic level of sustainability. And then you could perhaps offer them a zero carbon option or um, a lead certified option or something of that nature. Um, because that's something as a design firm that you're passionate about and have the skill set and the experience to deliver. And it's also something that you recognize many of your clients are interested in. They want a sustainable home at the end of the day. So that's, that's an example of how that would work. Hey, Architect Nation, real fast, I want to draw your attention to May 1st through the 3rd, 2019. I'm hosting the Architect Business Summit in Chicago, Illinois, and I would love to meet you there in person. During these three days, some of the most successful architects I've had the pleasure of working with will pull back the curtain to reveal what they're doing to grow their income, freedom, and impact as firm owners. This will be the must-attend event for architecture firm owners in 2019. You won't want to miss this. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash live to get information on who will be speaking and find out how to grab your ticket. Great. So we talked about number one, which is the focus on what we're charging in terms of a fee. Number two was just restricting ourselves to the traditional pricing model when you've explained a much more uh, adaptable and powerful model. What's mistake number three? Um, number three, in no particular order here, I would have to say is perhaps the presentation of our fee proposals. Um, traditionally, what most design professionals do when it comes to writing a proposal is they either use something, a template that they've kind of uh, adopted throughout their career, or maybe something that they've downloaded from the internet and then they put their own personal markings on. And typically this, this document they're using takes a very legal angle and a very sterile look at the proposals that they're sending. It's, it's basically a contract. Um, and why, um, while having a contract is not a problem, Initially, what we're trying to do at that very early stage, when we first meet the client, is rather than giving them a contract and, and shifting all the risk onto them at that very early stage, what we're trying to do is build a relationship and show them how we can help achieve their goals. So they've got goals that they're trying to achieve. And what we want our initial proposal document to do is show them how we can achieve that. So what we need to do is change the way we present our proposals, make them much more simple make them much more intuitive and easy to read, understand, and use. 
And then as we build the relationship with the client, we can also build the complexity of the information that we provide them with. Does that make sense? What specific tips or suggestions, Ian, might you offer for making that proposal more readable, more understandable, and more directed at the emotional needs of the client? So part of the, a big part of the fee letter, obviously, is to um, adopt this concept of, of second and third degree price discrimination, of offering the client options. Um, the other thing we would recommend is what we call a fee matrix. A fee matrix is, is a fancy name for basically a table. And a table is a fantastic tool for presenting different options at different price points. So clients can quickly read it. They can understand it. They can compare the service options and they can start to become engaged with you and how you can help them achieve their goals. Um, and it keeps it simple. Now, once they show an interest in one of your options, then what you're going to want to do is follow up with more detailed information on everything that's included within that option. So perhaps what we would traditionally call a scope of service or something of that nature. Um, so that's what we would recommend. Okay. What is mistake number four that you commonly see? Uh, we've kind of sort of talked about this already, but I would have to say um, number four is focusing too much on your own interests as a design professional and what you're trying to achieve without spending enough time looking at it from the client's perspective and think about what their interests are. So um, to become a very skillful and very successful fee proposal writer, what you need to be able to do is get into the mind of the client and think, what is it that's driving them? What's going to get them to say, yes, let's go and do this. I'm excited about it. I want to move forward. And what's going to get them to say, yeah, I don't know if I'm ready yet. Let me think about it. Um, because once we understand what their interests are, we can then address their interests. We can solve their problems within the options that we offer. Okay. Ian, what would be an example of focus on what we want as architects as opposed to what the client might want? Do you have any examples that you can think of or that you've seen? Uh, there's many, many examples. Um, as design professionals, as architects, we are obviously, by the nature of the industry, we are focused on the design. We want the best design possible. Um, we want the design to win awards, obviously, and we also want the design to look good on our own websites and so forth. So we're in, very invested in making sure that design is as spectacular as it can be. Um, but what we need to understand is that the client has needs to have the design uh, designed the way they would like it, but they also have other interests that they're trying to achieve. Some of them could be budget. It could be timing of the project. Um, and, and these types of things. And if we could also address those as well within our proposals, then we can start to check for the client of what they're trying to achieve, not just what we're trying to achieve. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think you gave some examples earlier as well about this. You said we touched upon it. Examples you mentioned, uh, they might be more focused on the budget, whereas residential clients might be more focused on their taste, what it, how the, the space represents them, how they look to their friends, other emotional needs like that. Exactly, exactly. So it's an interesting mindset shift. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> How do you have any tips for being able to make this mindset shift? Because I know in my work with a lot of architects that it does not come naturally, right? And we're, we're taught by our mentors, we're, we're indoctrinated in design school into a certain way of thinking, a certain way of representing what we do. And it's very hard to be able to look through the eyes of a client and truly understand and truly empathize with what is really important to them. Exactly. So the first thing to do, like many things in life, is to educate yourself to understand these different pricing models, how they work, how they can be implemented. So the first thing is to go back to basics, learn about it and understand how it all works. And that will help shift you slightly. Second thing is once you understand how these things work, um, then you want to start implementing them on a small scale with clients so that you can start to see how clients respond and just see how powerful uh, this new approach really is. And then I think once you start to see it work on a small scale, you'll get better ideas on how to implement it on perhaps a slightly larger scale as you, as you grow. So uh, that's what we would recommend. Education, start small and see how it responds as, as you grow. Awesome. All right, we're up to number five, and I'm sure there's more, but 
what's what's number five? The most five, five that the fifth most common thing that you um, see, Ian. The fifth, probably once again, in no particular order, would probably be the level of commitment we try and receive from the client at that first point of contact. Um, by that, what I mean is most of us meet with the client, learn about the project, and then we put our fee on the table to complete that project. So typically, we start a relationship by asking for a very large commitment from the client to complete the whole project, right? But actually, we'd be far more successful if we started the relationship by asking for a much smaller commitment first. Um, so as an example, instead of giving the client a fee to design, the, if it's a residential project, the whole uh, residential home, instead of starting off the relationship with that big commitment, we'd be much better off at starting off the relationship by offering the client a feasibility study, a pre-designed service, something of that nature, um, or perhaps a written report that explains to them what they can achieve on their site, what the zoning and planning controls will allow them to build, how big that could be, um, and offering that service at a very small fee. Um, and what we're going to do want to do is make sure we focus that service on the client's interest once again. So what are their immediate questions that they need answered? How can we answer those questions for them? And how long is it going to take us so we can put it together in a report and offer them a very small fee to achieve that goal? Um, and that way it gives us both an opportunity to work together on a very small scale, see if we're actually a good fit as a client and a design professional, see if we work well together. Um, and see if our expectations are in the, aligned in the same manner. Um, and then if that does work well, then we can move on to larger commitments, perhaps designing the entire project for them. Awesome. So Ian, is there any other insights that you'd like to share with our listeners today about writing effective proposals and really getting the clients across the line? Yeah. Um, yeah, my last thing I'll probably leave or I'll leave you with is to say that don't leave writing fee proposals to chance. Don't just let it uh, sit there as something you feel you have to do. And the knowledge you, you have from doing this is simply passed down from perhaps peers in your office or something of that nature. Don't leave it to chance. Don't leave it to your gut feelings or your instincts because they will lead you astray. Instead, you'd be far more successful at this if you just learn some basic core principles about human behavior and the emotional side of writing and uh, negotiating design fees um, and also the economics of it all, the, the actual sort of mathematics behind how these different pricing models work and how you can implement them. And uh, if you do that, I think you'll be very surprised at just how much more control and perhaps how much more success you can have with your fee proposals. Awesome. Ian Motley, thank you for being with us today on the Business of Architecture podcast. Thank you very much for having me. And that is a wrap. I hope you enjoyed my conversation today with Ian Motley about the five proposal mistakes that he sees most often. As a podcast listener, I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars for firm owners that I've prepared specifically to help you with two critical issues that affect firm owners as they run and as they grow a firm. The first issue is being overwhelmed on a day-to-day -day basis of responding to fires instead of being able to take a step back, work on what you love, have a profitable business, and even have a business that you can sell one day. If you'd like to discover how to get yourself out of the day-to-day -day grind, take a more strategic approach in your business, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar to access a special online training where I'll be sharing the stories of firms just like yours, firm owners, that have been able to liberate themselves from the stress and constant fires of running a firm and have really built a practice that they're enthused by and that they love. The second seminar that I'll point you to is a special presentation that I've prepared about the most effective way to market and get the word out about your architecture firm. Once again, this is a free training for podcast listeners. You can find it by going to architectwebinar.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.